In this lecture, we're going to look at the general problem of representing a signal in terms of a series of bases or basis signals. So what we mean by representing a signal in terms of bases is to write a signal x of n as a weighted combination of other signals where I have some weights a k and these other signals or the basis signals are psi k of n and we have a bunch of these k equals one two and so on so we're saying that we're using these psi k's as building blocks to construct our signal x of n. A familiar example of this is the discrete Fourier transform where we use sinusoids psi k of n equals e to the j k 2 pi over cap n times little n and here capital N is the number of time samples in x and we can write then that x of n is equal to the sum from k equals 0 to n minus 1 x k e to the j k 2 pi over cap n times little n. So in this case these complex sinusoids are our basis signals, our building blocks if you will, and the coefficients associated with those, the a k in my general notation up here, are given by the DFT coefficients. Now why do we want to do something like this? Well the general goal is to use a basis that results in a low dimensional description of the signal of interest. By low dimensional we mean that there's only a small number of coefficients that are needed to represent the signal that we're interested in and consequently those other coefficients are associated with noise. So if we can accomplish something like this then there's three different types of problems that can be addressed. The first is I'll call a compression problem where by compression I'm looking for an efficient way of storing x of n and if I'm able to find some set of bases that involve only a small number of non-zero a k for the signals of interest then as long as I know those bases and can build them I can throw away the comp components associated with the a k's that are zero or small and consequently I can represent my signal using a relatively small number of coefficients and from a compression standpoint rather than storing a k I just rather than storing x of n I just store the a k and then use my knowledge of the bases that I've chosen to reconstruct x of n from the a k that have been stored and the gain that I get in terms of storage is proportional to the original dimension of x and the number of coefficients that I need to store in the eight k's. A second problem that this representation allows us to solve is a general notion of filtering and the idea there is that some of the a k are associated with the signal of interest others are associated with noise so I'm going to clean up or filter x of n by throwing away the AKs that are associated with noise and keeping those that are associated with the signal. The conventional notion of frequency selector filtering where we have a pass band and a stop band is somewhat built on this principle because if I interpret my bases in terms of say the DFT where I have frequencies I'm keeping some frequencies and I'm throwing away other ones. And lastly, we can talk about interference reduction, where if some of the AKs are associated with interfering signals and others are not, then by zeroing out the ones that are associated with interfering signals, we reduce the overall interference in the signal. Now, in terms of these goals, it needs to be stated up front that there is no universally optimal set of bases. And by optimal, I mean is that bases which give a very small number of coefficients for any signal. That's just not true. So there's been many different bases that have been proposed and some of those are better for certain types of signals than others. We're going to describe three different categories of bases. One category I'm calling fixed or deterministic bases and this is a case where we choose some waveforms ahead of time that don't change but are known. So if we do like the DFT, there we have sinusoids where we've chosen the, the frequencies to be uh, multiples of 2 pi over n. So they're known ahead of time and we've chosen these bases and so everything about them is known. Another example is wavelets. 
where you choose a particular family of wavelets and that gives you a set of basis functions once you make that choice. There's another category of basis functions and those are what I'm going to call data adaptive. In this case we're going to use observations of our data and statistics we compute from them to find a good set of bases. Examples of this include principal component analysis, something called canonical component analysis, and independent component analysis. All of these methods use the statistics of the data to find a set of bases that are optimum with respect to a certain criteria. And then the third category is what I'm going to call parametric bases. And in this case, we know the functional form of the basis signals, but they just might depend on some unknown parameters. So for example, if we know that we want to use a sinusoid as a basis signal, but we don't know what the right frequency is, that would be a parametric basis, because I know the shape of the basis is a sinusoid, I just don't know what the frequency should be. So the frequency is an unknown parameter that describes the basis. Another example would be if I knew that I wanted to use an impulse as a basis, in other words a signal that is only on at a certain time and it's off everywhere else, but I don't know what the onset time would be. So in that case I have again, I know the shape of my basis signal, I just don't know this unknown parameter as to when this should turn on. So these are three different ways of, of choosing bases that are used in the literature. So how does this basis function expansion and work in a general sense once we have a set of basis signals psi k of n? Well, we're going to stack our data x of 0 through x of n minus 1 into an n by 1 vector x with an underscore. And then we're going to similarly stack our kth basis signal into an n by 1 vector psi k. And we'll assume that since this is an n-dimensional problem, that I have a total of n bases available to me. And in that case, I can write my signal x as a sum of my basis coefficients ak times these basis signals psi k. And we're going to sum from k equals 1 to n. And I can collect all the basis signals into a basis matrix, capital psi, collect all the coefficients into a vector a, and just write this as expansion of x terms of these bases is a product of a matrix psi times a vector a. Well, if these psi k are linearly independent, that means that each psi k brings some new information about the signal that's not represented in the existing set of psi k, then n of them are sufficient to represent any signal because this x is n-dimensional, so n components will represent any signal. And the linear independence also implies that this matrix, psi, is an invertible matrix. It's an n by n matrix, and it's full rank, so it'll be invertible. And therefore, if I want to know what the a's are, I can get the a's by inverting psi and multiplying that times x. So I sort of have this equivalence between my expression for the coefficients in terms of x, and I have, on the other side, my expression for the data in terms of the bases and the coefficients. So this is like a transform and of course the DFT fits into this category where on the left hand side here we'd have the frequency coefficients and on the right hand side we'd have the time domain signal. Now there's a very important case and that's when the bases are orthogonal. And what we mean by orthogonality is that the sum over all n of psi k times psi l complex conjugate is zero when l is not equal to k. And this sum is just the inner product of the vectors psi l complex conjugate transpose times psi k. And again, orthogonality implies that that's zero when l is not equal to k. If that's true, then it turns out that psi inverse can just be real represented in terms of the original size, psi 1, complex conjugate transpose, normalized by the squared length of psi 1. And then in the second row, we have psi 2, complex conjugate transpose, normalized by the squared length of psi 2, and so on. And you can verify that if I multiply this matrix psi, which I'm calling psi inverse, times psi, I'll get back 
the identity matrix. And that's a consequence of psi 1h times psi 2h, or times psi 2, being equal to 0, and so on. Consequently, when I have orthogonal bases that satisfy this property, I can find my kth basis coefficient using this formula, psi inverse times x, and it turns out that, of course, the kth basis here in this vector is just the kth row of psi inverse times the data x, and since the kth row of psi inverse depends only on psi k, I see that my kth basis coefficient depends only on psi k, and I can write ak is equal to psi k complex conjugate transpose x, then divided by the length squared of psi k. And rewriting this inner product in terms of a sum over the samples n gives us this expression shown here. Well, the discrete Fourier transform is an example of a case of orthogonal basis signals. So remember, for the DFT, my basis signals are e to the jk 2 pi over cap n times little n, and consequently, my inner product between the elf basis signal and the kth one can be written as this sum, where I have the sum n equals 0 to cap n minus 1, e to the minus j l 2 pi over cap n times n, times e to the jk, 2 pi over cap n times n. And I'm not going to go through the algebra of this, but it's fairly easy to show that when k is not equal to l, that this sum is exactly 0. And when k is equal to l, of course, then these exponents cancel, and I'm left with the sum from n equals 0 to n minus 1 of 1, and that's exactly n. So capital N is the length squared psi l complex conjugate psi l. And when we write down the discrete Fourier transform formula, we see from what we had above here for orthogonal bases that ak is 1 over the length squared times this inner product that we exactly recover the discrete Fourier transform, which says that ak would be, this is the kth frequency coefficient in the DFT, is just going to be 1 over n times the sum of the kth basis function, complex conjugate, times the data x of n. So the beauty of orthogonal bases is that they greatly simplify this process of finding the basis coefficients because we have a known form for the inverse of the basis matrix. So basis function expansions are extremely powerful and widely used in signal processing and they fit into a fairly simple general formula. And then as you look at special cases you of particular basis choices, you can see why some bases are advantageous over others.